But um, Nasser is sponsoring this and organizing it, uh, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. And we have several co-sponsors, um, including the Armenian International Women's Association, um, UPAT, Bridging Armenian Women, the Armenian Bar Association. Um, the Carlos Blanca Foundation is helping to sponsor it as well. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to um, let you know about it. We hope you come. Tufts, Wednesday night, 7.30. Yes. yes. Thank you. Say something really quickly. I'm sorry to interrupt. It just strikes me this community of people who are here. Like, is there a way to get um, an email list of people who have attended? Not, not to exclude people who couldn't get here, but just for future events. Um, yes. I just feel like it's so precious that people have come. This many people have come for an event of this kind, and it would be <coughs> nice to um, be able to have a record of people who came and maybe we could, you know, maybe there'll be some yes, emails. are taking the same idea. No? <laughs> <laughs> With name, 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 last name, email, and maybe you what you do, do or <laughs> what you do or what you work, what you're interested in. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So we are now starting our uh, first panel of the afternoon, uh, which we titled Unblocking Memory, How to Rewrite Armenian History. And I have uh, here physically four um, scholars who are historiographically grounded, one way or another, as well as Huri Berberian, who is joining us from somewhere in California. So in our email, what happened? An undisclosed location? Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I assume at least. Um, in our uh, preparations for this uh, workshop, Melissa and I sent some questions to each panelist um, that are specific to, to their work, but also some common questions that we would like to address in one panel. This panel has more of a history focus, both personal and otherwise. So some of the questions that we posed to them were these, what is their intellectual trajectory? Again, bringing the personal um, under the limelight and specifically their career in Armenian studies. And specifically, <coughs> if, uh, basically <coughs> try to uh, push them to share with us their uh, gendered problems if they had any within Armenian studies as both women subjects doing Armenian studies, but also uh, scholars who are working on uh, Armenian women's history or not, uh, depending on how you uh, phrase it, how you think about it. Um, we also ask them the kind of issues that you might have, in, they might have encountered in academia uh, <coughs> because of them working on <coughs> Armenian <coughs> specifically. <laughs> what is happening? Okay, I, I have the good competition here. What am I going to do? I can always bring my daughters. <laughs> this is comic relief. Yeah. Okay. Puri, contain your cat, please. <laughs> Okay, Huri Berberian, along with uh, Christina Maranji, is one of the two uh, chairs in Armenian studies. In the United States, we have 14 chairs in Armenian studies, and only three of them are held by women. So we also ask them uh, what they think about this uh, presence or absence. And we also want to question here the ways of different ways of doing history that does not necessarily involve academia. And specifically, we have the Iva case that I think we should put a little bit more emphasis, both in terms of what Iva published, but also the conferences on that involved Armenian women and Armenian women's studies that Iva has been organizing uh, for a long time. Um, also, as already been mentioned, Iva is, um, has been translating uh, text, so we would like to also think about the meaning of translation from the perspective of Iva and the reasons why they uh, invested uh, to sponsor these translations. I know Jennifer had already talked about it, but it would be interesting to potentially return to it. So with that, uh, the first uh, presenter is <coughs> Isabel Caprielian Churchill. 
who joins us from Toronto. She is Professor Emerita of Armenian and Immigration History, Department of History, California State University, Fresno. She in the past taught in the School of Graduate St Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, she is a really accomplished, uh, she published m a number of books as well as articles, so I'm just going to mention the last one, and the extensive biographies of everyone is in the booklet that you have. Uh, the last one is uh, Mercy, uh, Sisters of Mercy and Survival, Armenian Nurses, 1900 to 1930, 2012, publication date, which won the Richard and Tina Caro Carolan Literary Fund Award. Um, what I'm also going to mention is her engagement with the curriculum at the higher level. She worked with Toronto District School Board to include the Armenian genocide in grade 11. And it would be interesting actually to hear more about that. She also produced two documentary videos with accompanying teacher guides for elementary school students. Uh, one of them is the Georgetown Boys, Armenian Orphans in Canada, and Rose's Triumph, the story of an Armenian refugee girl which they produced both in English and in Armenian. And with that, Isabel, the floor is yours. And Thank everyone you. has 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15? Yeah, as we discussed before, <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this historic event. Uh, you know, as we are studying history, we're making it, and we're making it. And I'd also like to say that for me, it's an, a great pleasure to be here with so many young, bright Armenian women. Now my natal Armenian, my natal urban village in Hamilton, Ontario was closely knit, warm and caring. As a youngster, I was an active participant in this vibrant Armenian community. I attended after four Armenian school, I sang Verkerovli, John Fedayem, and Lucin Chigar. I read about General Antranig and Sartarabad. And I was a little kid who went around collecting water from seven houses so my mother could have Vijag the next day. In this little world, they called me Zabel. Not only was I a proud Armenian, but I was also Germansi my father's natal village, and sometimes I was Erzurumsi, my mother's hometown. And I loved being Zabel. I also was part of another world with different behavioral patterns, different culture and language. Here I read about William the Conqueror, Louis, Louis Riel and the Red River Resistance, I sang, O Canada, and Alouetta, and Jesus Loves Me. And here they called me Isabel. In those days, a clear divide separated these two solitudes. There was very little overlapping. When I was in the middle of my life, a new field of history, ethnic studies, opened up. I plunged headlong into this new field in my pursuit to write about my Armenian heritage, to mainstream it, to give it stature. I was thrilled by Bob Myrak's Torn Between Two Lands, that very important pioneering study. For my work, there were no secondary sources, and the primary sources were well hidden beneath the surface. I began interviewing community members. Now this would have been in the late 1970, early 1980s. Most of the early settlers had passed, but many were still alive, primarily women, and some had sharp memories. For them, the interviewing was like an avalanche. Knowing they were facing death, my interviewees were determined to share their confidences and unburden their souls. For me, the interviewing was like Niagara Falls. I became immersed in their stories and entranced by their testimonies. 
Now I'm aware of the pros and cons of oral history and the joys and pitfalls of relying on memory, but I must emphasize that those interviews were like keys unlocking memories, like magical wands unleashing emotions. As well, they were multifaceted transfers of much needed and greatly appreciated factual information. 1986, I published an article examining how Armenian refugee women, all survivors, had contributed to enhancing Armenian communities in southern Ontario. In 1993, I published its sister article about Armenian picture brides and their experiences in a strange new world. Now, one of the questions I was asked was why I wrote about the picture brides. Many of the women I interviewed were picture brides, and I wanted their voices to be heard and their stories to be published for posterity. Intellectual motives also compelled me. I needed to understand how these surviving women had coped with their losses and their pain, for every one of them had suffered. Wounded by tragedy and without the pre-genocide support structures, these young survivors from disparate parts of the Ottoman Empire bonded with each other. Like mutually dependent sisters, they embraced one another. Together, they refashioned their destinies. They grappled with tragedy head on. And in their recovery, they found their greatest solace in their children, their children who represented their hopes and their nation's future. I also wanted to examine how a group of women survivors had rekindled their culture in the diaspora and revitalized their heritage in the New World. Now, before 1914, a few relatively small Armenian communities existed in Canada, and they, they were composed of some families, but a larger, much larger contingent of single men, that is to say, men without women. They weren't bachelors, they weren't all bachelors. Men who wanted to return to the old country. After the genocide, these settlements of now aging bachelors and widowers were waning. The newcomer women, mostly teenagers or in their 20s, left orphanages and refugee camps with anxious hearts. They traveled halfway across the world to marry strangers in a strange land. They must have taken some comfort that they were going to a safe, civilized, and Christian country. Now, I have two uh, funeral photographs which highlights these demographics. The first one was taken around 1918, and it shows a group of about 17 men standing around an open casket. The second one, takes place, I'm not sure of the dates exactly, but I think around 1925-26. And it's of mostly the same men, only this time, and there is also an open casket, only this time there is a priest, there are 14 women, and five children. So these are two little gems in my own personal archives. Initially, the young women were hesitant and insecure. Not surprisingly so. But as they grew older and more experienced, they became more confident and exercised more authority in family and community affairs. They devoted their time and energies to building and nurturing dynamic Armenian community life. And these are the women that made my life as a child so very important. Their youth, strength, and vigor reverberating in Armenian communities around the globe served to resurrect the nation. Their efforts symbolize a microcosm of a global phenomenon, which in its own fashion 
was the culmination of the League of Nations estimate that 80% of the survivors were women and children. Now I come to the second question that they asked, and that is about nurses in my, sec uh, my, my uh, most recent book. In their work and dedication, the nurses also help save a nation as caregivers in hospitals, clinics, and orphanages. They save thousands of lives. As midwives, they save countless mothers, new mothers and babies, especially critical in conditions of poverty and malnutrition. And as public health nurses, they travel from village to village, bringing hygiene and sanitation education. Furthermore, for hundreds of girls and young women, nursing provided a job, even a profession, so that nurses could support themselves and their families. They could be independent and not feel constrained to marry someone, anyone, just for a breadwinner. <laughs> Armenian nurses were the pioneers of modern nursing in Turkey, the Armenian Republic and Soviet Armenia, in Greece and in Syria, Lebanon. And I'm sorry to say that they are invisible. We don't hear very much about the work that Armenian nurses have done. The organizers asked how this book has been received. It was published in Antilias, and the Catholic estate does not have an active marketing and distribution presence in North America. So it has not been act effectively marketed here, nor is it easy to acquire. If you order from the press directly, uh, and if you have it sent by air, it's very expensive, and if you have it sent by sea, it takes forever. And it's not found in many university libraries, for that matter. The book has been reviewed in a few Armenian newspapers, and I've spoken of a few uh, Armenian and non-Armenian venues. It has not, to my knowledge, been reviewed in the Armenian American journals, nor for that matter, I should say, that neither was my previous book uh, about the history of Armenians in Canada. Aside from a few scholars like Lerna, Armenian scholars in general have shown little interest in the nurses. Well, I don't know whether this is because of the heroines in the book or the gender of the author. Okay, I come to the third part of my presentation, and that is to do with uh, Armenian studies and gender. More than 20 years ago, I was hired to hold a chair in the history department at Fresno State. My courses were split 50-50 between the history department and the Armenian studies program. Uh, it was not a department, and I don't think it, it, it is today. And it was run by a coordinator. <clears throat> In exchange for a, an approximately $300,000, the donor had negotiated this chair. And in the 1990s, that was nowhere near enough for an endowed chair, even then. All expenses for the chair, including salary and office and so on, came out of history's budget. Now I can say that history wasn't particularly excited about that. In his turn, the coordinator was opposed to an Armenian chair in the history department. To complicate matters further, no love was lost between the coordinator and some of the senior history faculty. Thus, the project started on an ominous footing. Long before I arrived, a contract had been drawn up between the university and the donor with input from the coordinator and history. They all signed off on it. They all signed off on it. So when I was considering applying for tenure, I was shocked to learn that one of the clauses in that contract gave the coordinator of Armenian studies 
the final decision on the chair's tenure. In other words, the coordinator held the power to reverse the tenure committee's decision. And it reminds me of Mata's sovereign issue. <laughs> I wrote a two-liner to the two deans involved requesting clarification. All hell broke loose. The university could not honor the contract because it violated all tenure rules. And the coordinator refused to relinquish control. Eventually, the donor, a man in his 90s, broke the deadlock by siding with the coordinator. He pulled out his money from history and so destroyed the chair that bore his name. The outcome was unfortunate for one principal reason. The biggest loss, in my view, and in the end, the only real loss, was to Armenian history. History department eventually got its European historian, and the university got the money back from the, from the donor, and it went to Armenian studies to set up a, an, an annual guest lectureship um, in the Armenian studies program. And I was granted tenure through the, the normal tenure committee process. But back to Armenian history. Just as we are trying to move Armenian women's studies into mainstream feminist scholarship, I saw my mandate as consolidating a foothold of Armenian history in the history department. Mm -hmm. I had introduced two new Armenian history courses and housed them in history, uh, cross-listed with the uh, Armenian program. One was Armenians in North America, and the other one was genocide in comparative context. In my opinion, the presence of a scholar of Armenian history in the history department would have held great future potential for my successors. When I retired some years later as a tenured full professor, the Armenian history professorship in the department succumbed, as I knew it would. My courses are still listed in the catalog, but I doubt if anyone has taught them since I left. And it's rather ironic, because the person who started the history, uh, the Armenian history program was Luis Nalbandian, mm -hmm. who wrote about the Armenian revolutionary parties. And she died in a very tragic car accident before all of this could develop. Now, I was asked by the organizers what role gender played in my relations with Armenian studies. From the first week, I felt the barbs and indignities of misogyny in a very unwelcoming environment. By the way, this is the first time I've talked about this in public. But the crisis went deeper and had broader and more complex implications. As I have explained, the setup of the chair was flawed creating an authoritarian and patriarchal structure, as demonstrated by the decision to destroy the chair rather than relinquish control. Scholars, men, women, then, now, must have academic freedom as a basis for creative contributions to their chosen field of study. So why should Armenian scholars have anything less? As for Armenian studies, whether it's history, religion, music, feminist studies, or genocide studies, they need to be mainstream too. It's time we move beyond our borders. And you can call it transnational, you can call it whatever you want, but we have to get into the mainstream. And that's why I support this program, this project that Lerna and Melissa have started.
100%. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Isabel. Um, specifically for the whole uh, presentation, but also for bringing up the name of Luis Nalbantian, which we could have also included in the chain where we mentioned Nina Garsoyan and Sirar Pider Nalbantian. Um, yes. No, who is Nalbantian? Okay. Der Nersesian. SRP. Hmm? It was Luis Nalbantian. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Luis Nalbantian. Luis Nalbantian. Exactly. Okay, the second... Uh, um, scholar that we will be hearing oh, from is Barbara Mergerian, who is a writer, editor, and historian. She received her BA in international relations from Brown University, her MA and PhD in history from here, Harvard, and she also uh, taught in several higher education institutions, including Tufts, Yerevan State University, and California State University in Fresno. Uh, she is a former editor of the Armenian Mirror Spectator and of the Journal of Armenian Studies. And she is the editor or co-editor of several book, books, including Explore, Exploring Gender Issues in the Caucasus and Voices of Armenian Women. Uh, she is a founder and past president of the Armenian International Women's Association, directs its archive archives and has edited or overseen most of its publications, including most recently three books by Zabel Yesayan in English translation. translation. Barbara. Yes. Thank you, Lerna. It's such a pleasure for me to be here today and to see so many friends in the audience and old friends and hopefully new friends. And thanks so much to Lerna and Melissa for putting us all together and for the project that they're doing. <clears throat> so as Lerna mentioned, she had sent us a list of 10 possible questions we could talk about. And frankly, I could talk 15 minutes about any one of them. Um, but it did seem to me that the most useful thing I could do that would be maybe different from what the rest of uh, the participants are doing is to talk about uh, the Armenian International Women's Association um, and the way it, particularly in the way it has interacted with Armenian studies. Um, I would like to begin with a word about my own uh, feminine consciousness. It just so happens that I had a brother who was eight years older than I was, and he was a big tease. And like many of you, I had a grandmother who I absolutely adored. But when I went to my grandmother and used to complain about my brother and how unjust he was to me, and he was teasing me all the time, and I thought she'd be sympathetic. But no, <laughs> she sat me down and said, I must always respect and obey my brother. One, he was older than I was. Naturally, that gave him precedence. Two, he was a male, and obviously that put him above me. And I, I totally rebelled against that. It seemed so unfair and unjust. But I did love my grandmother, and I had been taught to respect my elders. I did not argue with her. But I kind of put it in the corner of my mind and rationalized it as saying, well, she grew up in a different society. It was backward society. She didn't understand America. But that was my first uh, thinking about this whole issue. I, and in all honesty, my parents <clears throat> did not have that kind of an attitude. They were very fair to both of us. Um, and Outside of my own family, I actually did not grow up in the Armenian community. I was baptized in the Armenian church, but conditions were such that we didn't go to church. My mother sent me to the congregational church to make sure I had some religious instruction. And it really wasn't, even through um, high school and college, I had very few contact with Armenians outside of my family until I came to Cambridge uh, for my graduate work and <clears throat> starting with the um, Armenian Club at Harvard, which was very active when I was there, and then 
uh, getting more as I married and got into the community and became editor of the Mayor Spectator. Then I really got to know the community. That's another whole story that <laughs> I'll get into some other time and not today. But let's go ahead to 1990 when three, of, three women in the Boston area came together to discuss the possibility of forming an Armenian women's organization. <clears throat> That's Eva Medzorian, Olga Prudian, and myself. The women's movement was already several decades old in the United States, but it didn't seem to have had any effect on the Armenian community. <clears throat> And so the three of us decided that the time had come to form an Armenian women's organization. And the first thing, of course, people said, oh no, we have so many Armenian organizations, we don't need another one. And um, I, I do have to say that there were and there are many Armenian women's organizations who are wonderful, who do wonderful work, but for the most part, their aims are humanitarian and benevolent, and that's great, we need these things. But it just seemed that there should be a women's organization whose goal was to focus on the interests of women. And also a women's organization that was independent, not tied to a men's organization, something that was nonpartisan, nonpolitical, nonsectarian, nonprofit, all of those things. And so we came together, frankly, without much of an idea of what it was we were going to do. The first thing we did was to get a group of women together and to talk about what, what was our statement of purpose. And we came out with something that was very general, to unite Armenian women worldwide and to address the critical issues facing them everywhere. That's fine, but you know, how do you do that? So we had, a, a, within this general statement, we listed half a dozen specific purposes, and the relevant one to our discussion today would be to gather information about the changing role of women in the world, to monitor the activities of Armenian women, and to establish an Armenian women's archive. And I think at the time, we, at least I, considered this to be a question of just collecting stuff that was out there and putting it together in an archive. <clears throat> and to this end, we do have a small archives room at the Armenian Cultural Foundation here in Arlington where we have a small collection of books and material. And it's um, very fittingly named after Alice Connolly and Myrak, who was very important in the first days <clears throat> of our organization. So among our earliest initiatives were our international conferences, first in London in 1994, Paris 1997, and Yerevan 2000. I see a few people here who were at some of those conferences. So our, um, our establishment had actually coincided with the formation of the new Armenian Republic, the fall of communism. And there was quite a lot of scholarship going on then, research about post-communist societies and the role of women in those societies. And so we had some very interesting papers at those conferences about current issues facing um, women, particularly in Armenia. Um, and so we were able to publish the works of those first three conferences. We have three conference books, and they're still actually on our book list, and they are still being uh, read and sold. So personally, I had my own another um, eye-opening experience when I had the opportunity to teach for a semester at Yerevan State University. That was in 2000 in a program sponsored by the Zoros of a foundation to teach Armenian students how to think critically. And for some reason I decided to teach a course on women's history with a focus on Armenian women's history and that proposal was accepted. And I don't know why I did that, 
I had never taken a course on uh, women's studies. I had never taken a course in Armenian history. Um, it just seemed like an important thing to do just then and there, and I thought, well, I mean, I can do it. How hard could it be? Um, but then when I came to try to develop the course, I was actually shocked by how difficult it was to find material in any language about Armenian women. Um, I really hadn't expected to have that much difficulty. And then the second thing I learned is what a kind of skewed view of Armenian history Armenian students have. I mean, just to take one example, uh, when we had a discussion about the um, revolutionary movement in the late 19th century, well, I happened to, you know, we talked, I mentioned uh, Armenian women and the revolutionary movement. And that was met with total surprise and, and shock and disbelief. And I will never to this day forget the expression on the faces of the two men in the class. The class was mostly women. I mean, they actually thought I had made this up. I mean, the only thing they knew about women revolutionaries, Lenin had a wife who was Kupskaya. That was the only reference they had. And it was just so surprising to me. I mean, they never, I mean, um, not being a scholar of Armenian history, but everybody knows about Mara Vardanyan and her, her connection with the Hunchak party in its early days to say nothing about so many women revolutionaries. So there we are. So, so this and similar experiences made it clear that in terms of developing a woman's archive, it wasn't so much collecting material. You had to create it or commission it. So then we had to look at where should we go? I mean, as uh, Lerna said, we're so diverse. We have such a long history what aspect of the woman's history or women's question could you go into when we don't have huge resources? So as we were pondering these issues, a series of events drew our attention to the Zartunk, the Armenian Awakening, the late 19th, early 20th century, and women's role in it. Uh, we had Victoria Rowe, whose work was mentioned earlier, her book on Armenian, the early Armenian feminists. Uh, she came and spoke to us, and it was really an eye-opener for all of us, um, the, uh, the organizers in our audience, to, to think that there were these Armenian women who had written all these works about equality, justice for women, and we didn't know anything about it. And as we looked into it, it was not only that we as Armenian Americans who really don't know our Armenian history very well, not only we didn't know about it, but for different reasons, we found people who are educated in the Middle East, probably for political reasons. Maybe they had heard of Sabel Yassayan, but they didn't know much about her. Uh, people in Armenia, again, for political reasons because of... Um, because uh, that she had ended up in the gulag and was on blacklists. Uh, they did not know about her. And it's just, it just was so amazing that someone who had done all these things uh, and yet was so unknown, it was just incomprehensible. Um, so that way we fell into our first project, which was to translate the works of Sabel Yassayan. Um, and uh, so we subsequently, as you heard this morning, published three books. Um, and the books have been amazingly successful. I have to say partly because of the very inventive way that um, Judy Sarian has been able to market and publicize the books. Um, and I do want to mention uh, Judy and uh, Danila Terpanjan and Joy Rangelian Berge, who worked with me. We worked together on publication of the books, and it's been such a pleasure to do it. And it's been a pleasure to be part of a larger movement, I think, to recognize Zabel uh, 
uh, and to see that her books are now being translated or reprinted in Turkish and Armenian. And I know we've emphasized her, and we know there are many other women that we should be emphasized and we want to emphasize. Uh, we do what we can with the resources we have, and we're now working on <coughs> a publication translating um, Sipwi Dusap's uh, initial feminist novel, Maida, which we think is kind of basic to everything else. Um, I obviously don't have time to get into all of the other things Ewa has done. Um, I do want to mention one initiative we had um, that came out of our 2011 conference in San Francisco when our member from Geneva, uh, Talina Vakian, urged us to expand our archives program and to go into the uh, Yerevan State University. And she's a woman who just doesn't just talk, but she does things. So she invited Dr. Dima Dabus, who was at the time the head of the Lebanese Women's Institute in Beirut, to Yerevan in June 2012, where a group of us met <clears throat> over a weekend and put together a plan to um, uh, establish a center for women's studies at the American University of Armenia. And this would involve courses and it would involve a research center. And we had this great plan. We presented it to the president of the university, Bruce Bogosian at the time. He was enthusiastic. Everyone was enthusiastic, but then you come to the bottom line, which is the money. Um, so all we have to do is to you know, raise uh, money to establish a program there. I know there's a fairy godmother out there somewhere who will give the money for this, but we haven't found that godmother yet, but I'm sure she's out there. But there are so many, I think, opportunities for this kind of expansion of information about Armenian women, and I, I, I think a basic part of that is to have the material to get these things going, and that's why learners and um, Melissa's project is so important. And do I have any more time? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I just, well, what I wanted to end with, uh, just one sentence, that I do think women's studies are important beyond the academy. I think the situation in Armenia now is such that we really need to, to disseminate information about Armenian women. So I, and maybe I'm naive. I just think if we can somehow do this, it will help to open the society and democratize the society. And maybe it is naive, but I think we have to make the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Elisa Sanasaryan. She is a professor of political science and associate faculty in the gender studies program at the University of Southern California, specializing in comparative politics, politics and religion, ethnic politics, and women in international development. She is the author of uh, this book titled The Women's Rights Movement in Iran and Religious Mind, uh, sorry, the Women's Rights Movement in Iran, and another one, Religious Minorities in Iran. She is also, it's not in this biography, I just recognized, but she is the author of, to my knowledge, I'm not correct me, the first article on Armenian women's experiences during the genocide that it was published in genocide, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in 20 years ago. Right, maybe more than 20 years ago. And it is still, I mean, the field improved, but it is still a classic that everyone has to read it, anyone who's interested in that topic, including the footnotes, which we did with Anna. Uh, she has received, Elisana Saryan received various awards for her books as well as for her teaching and mentoring of students, including her university's highest honor of excellence in teaching and the Women's Student Assembly's Remarkable Women Award. Only the top part you can move. Can you take it off? Yeah. 
we are not able to take it off. It's okay. the best option I mean, is for you to change it first. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you, can you hear me? It's okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to this workshop. I was asked a number of questions, and I decided instead of giving my usual academic talk, I will just answer the questions that Melissa and Lerna were interested to know. Um, one good question number one was, uh, how come after publishing this article in Holocaust and Genocide Studies Journal, which was the top genocide studies journal uh, at the time, and I think still, because the article is reviewed by all the top experts of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, how come I did not continue? Uh, so my answer is, I tried. I applied uh, for funding. I submitted two proposals for funding because these, this article was based on oral history projects done on Armenian women survivors. I started by looking at men too, but I immediately dropped them because it was very <laughs> clear that they are exaggerating certain things and I wasn't sure how I can <laughs> separate uh, fact from fiction. Uh, uh, especially when I heard this uh, man saying during the interview that he was four years old and how an Ottoman Turkish soldier came to uh, kill his mother and he kicked him and he got scared and ran away. And so that's when I knew uh, I can. The women's uh, oral history was fascinating. They were very specific. They gave a lot of detail so that even if you ask them... Um, how did you know the rescuer was a Kurd? They would describe the clothing they were wearing and the hat they had on. I mean, it was just quite fascinating to hear. The oral history was based on oral history videos which were made by the Azorian Institute for Research, uh, Contemporary Research, which was based in Cambridge at the time, and I was on the board of directors, and we would always talk about we should use these oral history projects in some fashion, so I ended up um, using it, uh, them specifically for women. So I knew there was potential and I wanted to expand uh, and include more of these oral history projects. But uh, both of the proposals that I asked for funding were turned down. In those days, um, it was very common to turn down anything that had to do with the study of women, particularly women who were outside the United States and the Western world. Um, and uh, my experiences in academia were very much colored by that bias that was so prevalent. Um, I remember um, when I was interviewed at Berkeley for a tenure track position, um, I remember the door closing, and I realized that I'm, I'm the only woman in the room, mm. and the topic I'm talking about is women. <laughs> and I knew I won't get the job. It was just one of those revelations at the time. And of course, I was patronized by the chair at the end, uh, being told, uh, we hope you find your niche. Oh. Um, but the issue of ethnicity also hit me uh, shortly after. I was in a plane uh, going or coming from a conference, and I heard a heavy accent, and that was the accent of a Polish professor of political science I was going to replace if I was hired. And I turned and I said, hi, professor so-and-so. Um, I interviewed for your position last year. And he looked at me and he said, oh, yeah, you are the Armenian. And uh, I said, I am the professor. And he said, oh, yeah, you are the Armenian. I really want you to go tell all the Berkeley Armenian students not to demonstrate. I brought the Turkish ambassador to give a talk. And they demonstrated, and they wouldn't let him speak. And I said, you want me to go talk to them? <laughs> I don't even know who they are, where they are, what they are. 
Well, you have to tell them. And I realized that the bias and stereotype is so deeply ingrained, it has become literally DNA genetic material. <laughs> and and there, is, it's, there is no registration as to who I was, what I was, how unrelated I was to the event. When I came up for tenure, uh, right before I came up, I had a three-year, third-year evaluation. Already my book and several articles were out. And the committee uh, was mostly male-dominated. The committee wrote uh, that I should get away from focusing on unimportant or minuscule subject matters to more important and relevant subject matters. So I just wrote something, a rebuttal, but also I went and yelled at them. And I said, 50% of the population of the world is minuscule. Just imagine what your research is if mine is minuscule. <laughs> and <laughs> so, yeah. so I made a copy of it and I said, I'm keeping this in case I have to sue you. And they got very nervous. They went. <laughs> And they changed the wording. But you see, in those days, they could turn you down. They would turn people down all the time for all kinds of reasons. But that's the kind of environment that uh, many of us operated at the time. Uh, just to add that right after all those funding for a proposal for expanding the article were turned down, I got a visiting professorship at Harvard to do research on the documents that they had regarding uh, the uh, Islamic Republican Parliament or Islamic Assembly or National Assembly and their debates. So that's what really ended up being my second book. Do I consider myself, I was asked, part of Armenian studies? In all honesty, I don't know. <laughs> um, my first experience with uh, Society of Armenian Studies uh, was uh, in 1980s. I don't know if even I had a tenure track position at the time. I don't remember. But I remember being on member of the Council of the Society for Armenian Studies, and I was the only female. I don't remember how I got on the council. Either somebody died and the council <laughs> members voted for me, or the, all the membership voted. But I don't remember that. What I remember was my first meeting that I attended. And then um, I remember before we even started with the agenda, it was a room full of people who were affiliated. A lady got up, I don't know who she was, and said that I, sh I shouldn't be on the council because the focus of my work is not on Armenians. Um, and somebody like me should not serve on the council. So I mean, they got up and said, oh, okay, I'll go. And uh, other council members said, no, 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 stay, stay. And they tried to rationalize and justify why I should be there. So that was my first experience, no good. <laughs> um, just to be specific at this point, I have two pieces that focus only on Armenians because that generally has been the modus operandi of whether you are a part of society for Armenian studies. But most of my work has been comparative, including the second book, um, because that's my field. But one cannot do comparative study unless one has um, enough material on all the cases you're going to compare to be able to compare. So if something doesn't exist in a certain area, then I cannot do my work. Uh, uh, I was also asked a question about uh, how uh, women's studies in other areas, and in my case I've published on Iran, um, are different or what lessons can be learned from it. and. Um, I want to say, I want to answer that by uh, uh, really referring to uh, the feminist activist uh, Nasrin Khorasani, who translated my first book, The Women's Rights Movement to Iran, um, to Persian. Um, and of course, uh, that translation of that book won the best book prize uh, in Iran. Um, and as everything is dramatic when it comes to Iran. Um, uh, the book was awarded the best book prize. Uh, women demonstrated throughout the country 
uh, because the book is about uh, 1900s and also early 20th century and the rise of women's movement based on archives I had found at Princeton. Anyway, then um, the translator was taken to jail and then uh, um, the Nobel Prize winning lawyer, uh, Shirin Abadi, went to jail to get her out and these were all the day that the awards were being granted. And then, of course, I was told, don't come, don't come, you'll be arrested. But I wasn't going to go. And um, uh, so uh, I was told to write something as to what inspired me to write that. And I wrote about a Muslim woman who moved to our household when, um, before I was born. And she was a village woman. Uh, and uh, she really became like a mother and grandmother, a mother to my mother and a grandmother to me. And uh, when I, was, I turned nine years old, she uh, said, honey, you're so lucky to be born in this family. When I was nine, I was married uh, to a 30-year-old man. And she said, I remember two things about my marriage night. One, that I was sitting there and my feet would not touch the ground, and everybody else's feet were touching the floor. And I thought, oh, I'm ashamed of myself. I have short feet. And the second thing she said I remember is that um, I was bored. I didn't understand what these old people were talking about, and I wished I had my doll to play with. Mm -hmm. And I think the rise of my sense of feminism should be traced to mm -hmm. her. When Nassim translated my book, she sent me the introduction to the book that she had written. That's why the panel on translation was so fascinating for me, because the role of the translator, and I could see that in her introduction. It was a very careful, um, carefully written introduction, and in it, she said, uh, she explained why she chose my book versus all these other books that I have written, including by a lot of, you know, Iranian, Persian women and academics. And um, the, it was risky to translate it because I had a chapter that was very critical of the Islamic regime and the coming to power of Ayatollah Khomeini, and I'm very blunt when I write. And uh, so she said, I hope Professor Sanisarian understands why we should leave out certain things. Um, and so this is also an edited as well as a translated uh, book. But in it, she identified two things in the book that appealed to her. And that was a lesson to me about the way in which you can be a scholar but also have an impact on uh, feminist activism or any kind of activism out there. One of them was the definition of feminism. She said that she had read a lot of definitions of feminism and very, theory, very many theories, and I understand I taught feminist theory for some time. And she said, but um, my definition was very simple and straightforward. And it allowed for inclusion of any category of people in this definition, rather than being exclusionary. And it simply said, women should have the right to participate in any social, economic, political activities that they desire, and then have uh, you know, whatever uh, you know, qualifications that they have. So I have a whole statement on it. So that appealed to her. The second thing that appealed to her was the comparative aspect. I had interjected anything comparative that I had found from Mexico, Brazil, other parts of the world. And she said the young generation wants to know where they stand compared to others, and this is a very important part of their consciousness. Um, one other thing that she mentioned, which was a conclusion of my book, I said, I think that the study of any kind of feminist movement or any kind of movement should have authenticity. And I think that authentic voice is extremely important. And that's what I saw in Lerner's book by Stanford University Press, which I ended up reviewing it. Uh, by Genocide International Genocide Journal, 
and it's, uh, it's very authentic. It goes to original sources, but it also looks at it and analyzes it, analyzes it in a very dynamic new way. So that is a voice of authenticity, and it should come from within, in my opinion, of countries and communities. It cannot be imposed from the top. I wrote an article last year which I presented at Tel Aviv University not about women, but about study of ethnic ethnicity as well, that it should be the same thing. And today, for example, inside Iran, I argued there are fabulous work being done on their ethnic groups. And in fact, I received an email just a couple of weeks ago from a professor who wants to translate my second book on religious minorities in Iran, uh, which I cautioned him. I think it's still risky to do such a thing because of the inclusion of the Jews and Baha'is and Christian convert that I have in the manuscript. And in conclusion, I would also want to sh uh, say that when we go beyond this, I think then we incorporate women. Um, then we incorporate women into any kind of a study that we do. So incorporation becomes very important. So that if the work is on, let's say, ethnic minorities, you also talk about women. Uh, within that ethnic group and how it's impacting on it. So it's not only specializing, but also incorporating dynamically, and I'll stop here. So I got to start. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, our next presenter is Huri Berberian, uh, whom you have been looking at, to whom you have, and the, the cat too. Uh, she is a professor of history and the Merruni Family Presidential Chair in, Arme in Armenian Studies and the director of the Armenian Studies Program at the University of California, Arvis. Arvis. Irvine. Irvine, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about what's happening out there. Is things under control? Okay, she's the author of a number of articles and the book, Armenians and the Iranian Constitution Revolution of 1905 to 1911. The love for freedom has no fatherland. Her next book, which we are really looking forward to, is Roving Revolutionaries, Armenians and Connected Revolutions in the Russian, Iranian, and Ottoman world from 1905 to 1911, which will be forthcoming from the University of California Press. Hori. I want to join uh, the panelists in thanking uh, Lena and Melissa for uh, putting this uh, wonderful workshop together. And I also want to apologize for not being there in person. It's not for a lack of trying. I I was in transit with Jennifer Mukherjee all day yesterday, traveling to Boston. <laughs> I can't, we can't, they're recording. Should I continue? Uh, please, yeah. I tried. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I'm doing a similar thing to Elise and uh, answering questions yeah. that were provided for me. Uh, so the one of the first questions was, so what basically led me to study women's lives? Uh, and my interest <coughs> in studying women's lives, uh, I, I think came quite uh, developed quite naturally and organically, at least for me, uh, because it made complete sense uh, studying women as part of larger developments uh, taking place in early 19th and uh, in the 19th and early 20th century Iranian Armenian community. And in the case of the development and establishment expansion of uh, girls and boys schools, uh, it was very clear that the driving force behind this expansion uh, were women and their charitable organizations. So it made perfect sense then to go there. Um, I also noted a lack of scholarship on Armenian women in general uh, and an absence of scholarship that explored themes beyond sort of the great women uh, history approach that has often uh, been done. And there were certainly, uh, there was certainly a lack of comparative or transnational histories that, are, that were being done. So what I think distinguished my study um, was less the role of women, uh, that, less the role that Armenian women played in activism and education, but how their activities compared to other minority women in Iran and the Middle East, particularly Jews and Baha'is. Uh, and to me, that's the 
perhaps the most important aspect of that article. What was common to all uh, and served as the determinant, uh, the major determinant factor uh, for secular Western style education uh, was that uh, they were all uh, uh, helped, assisted uh, by an outside diaspora community, uh, which they sought to imitate to, uh, and uh, be influenced by. Uh, and they all identified with the West, uh, a sense of affiliation that rendered them unlike most Muslims of the period. Uh, so this comparison, uh, I think, uh, was an important part of what I was doing. Uh, and I think in general, uh, placing Armenian women in the larger regional and comparative context uh, is equally as important as bringing women, Armenian women to the foreground. Uh, and that kind of comparative work, uh, I believe, should continue uh, to be done. Uh, the second major essay on Armenian women, this time Armenian Iranian women in early modern uh, New Jufa, uh, there I attempted a similar approach uh, by expanding the way we view Armenian women and gender. Uh, in this case, I tried to uncover uh, the world of New Jufa women through an analysis of Armenian laws governing women's status and gender relations, and also looking at documents like wills, petitions, powers of attorney, uh, all produced by women themselves. And so I show that in addition to archival documents, uh, our Armenian <coughs> prescriptive codes uh, contribute to our understanding of the possibilities of legal and rights for women, and a much more active and uh, public participation in the family economy than European observers at the time, or even modern, modern scholars could have imagined. Uh, second, I revealed a rather paradoxical situation, whereby New Julfa is at once a locus of greater agency and access to economic resources for women, and also one of rather strict and punish and strict and punishments regarding moral and sexual transgressions. Uh, that intended to regulate new Jufun women's lives in the context of absent men, uh, fathers and husbands who were merchants who were some away uh, traveling for years and even decades. And third, and most exciting for me actually, uh, was that I argued that the law codes exposed the many parallels between Armenian laws and Sharia, Islamic law indicating uh, obvious yet surprisingly little studied connections or encounters between Sharia and Armenian customary law. So therefore the trajectory that my scholarship on women and gender has taken is due in large part to my continued interest and commitment to exploring the connectedness of Armenians to the wider world uh, in which they live. Um, and this, in a sense, brings us to the second question, which was uh, Armenians, Armenian historiography uh, on women and why, basically, uh, it has been gender blind and uh, how can we change it. So um, I may be talking to the choir, uh, but I will anyway. Uh, as a whole, uh, the, field, the field of Armenian studies has several serious flaws. Uh, and I realize that being quoted uh, the so, uh, first and foremost, it has been deeply entrenched, conservative, and sometimes unyielding. And it has often lacked a nuanced approach to history. And the issue of being gender blind in, in, in is inextricably tied to this general approach or this general problem. Until recently, it seems that the field has had little interest in approaches, themes, interpretations, that diverge from the accepted national or nationalist narrative, or that challenge collective memory or perceptions of ourselves and our paths. And gender and sexuality, and studies of gender and sexuality, do exactly that. They challenge. Explorations of sexuality, Armenian sexuality, uh, which are new words uh, not often used together. Sexuality <laughs> <laughs> uh, are uh, particularly thorny, and forgive the uh, term thorny, uh, because to some, to some degree, 
there are still remnants of sort of a shame and culture, a shame and honor culture among us. And sexuality, uh, LGBTQ issues, all these things um, seem people don't want to touch. Uh, and I think it does, uh, it does have something to do with some of us, uh, our conservative, um, still conservative culture. So non, uh, in general, uh, and it's not just us, but in general, non-feminist historians uh, especially, uh, uh, essentially dismiss the work on women, gender, and sexuality, uh, or try to divorce that kind of work from any connection to political or economic history or intellectual history. Basically, they have implied something like, great, women participated in such and such event, great, this is wonderful, but they do not necessarily then translate that or employ such studies to alter the way uh, to the, alter their way of thinking or their knowledge or understanding about the events that they study uh, or are interested in. Um, and I think, and at least that's the evidence uh, I have found in terms of most of the work done uh, until recently. Uh, and I'm going to, I don't know if it was done before uh, uh, in the earlier panels, but I'm going to bring Joan Scott into the picture. Uh, Jen, you know Joan Scott as uh, the author of many things, but one of which was an article she wrote on gender as a useful category of analysis. And she wrote, I quote, the challenge posed by these responses, this divorcing of uh, women and gender and sexuality from, you know, uh, more conventional histories. The challenge posed by these responses is in the end a theoretical one. It requires analysis not, o not only of the relationship between male and female experience in the past, but also of the connection between past history and current historical practice. How does gender work in human social relationships? How does gender give meaning to the organization and percep perception of historical knowledge? The answer depends on gender as an analytic category, end quote. With the category of gender, one cannot marginalize the study of women or dismiss their history. Their history is essentially interwoven with men's. So that is one, of, one other way to change the field, that is to bring gender as an analytical category, not marginal or autonomous, but interwoven and interactive. Related to this is the necessity to reconcile history, praxis, and theory. And to remember that we are not quitting the archives as historians, although some people might want us to, uh, but asking previously unasked questions, interrogating sources in novel ways, looking as much for what is there as what is not. So what I would like to see is far more scholars working on gender to insert themselves in quote unquote conventional histories and demonstrate in no uncertain terms how knowledge of gender in Armenian cases actually informs or changes our understanding of Armenian lives, culture, and history. This, I believe, is much more productive and can, pro can profoundly shift and open up largely gender-blind Armenian studies. The third question uh, that was put to me was uh, whether I teach courses on that uh, incorporate uh, or involve the history of Armenian women or whether others have used um, my work in their courses. And I do teach courses that include the study of Armenian women uh, as part of larger classes on women and gender in the Middle East. Uh, and But I also um, use it in courses I teach on Armenian history. Uh, so I would say 10 to 20% of courses. I have not taught a course on Armenian women only. And I have heard from colleagues um, that they do use some of my work, uh, but I don't actually know uh, to what extent. And last but not least, uh, the question about chairs. Um, how, um, why perhaps um, it's under, women are underrepresented as chairs? What are the potential causes? How can we fix it if, if it can be fixed? So there are 14 uh, chairs. Uh, but there are actually uh, three women holding them. Uh, one is uh, the speaker after me, Christina, uh, at Tufts, and then uh, another professor at Tufts, Ina Baldans-McCabe, and me, so three. There are also, I would like to add, 
two uh, directors of programs, uh, one at USC and one at Michigan, who are women. And the first ever chair in Armenian studies at Harvard was a woman, Nina Garsoyan. So if I'm going to see the glass half full rather than half empty, that's 30%. Uh, who have hold, uh, are holding or have held uh, chairs in the past. Um, the few, the fewer women holders of chairs, um, I think, is partly an issue of gender bias. Yes, but it's not wholly an issue of gender bias. Uh, there are other factors, including that until recently, fewer women actually pursued Armenian studies. And that, you might argue, uh, uh, validly, uh, possibly, that it may do to an entrenched patriarchal and even in some cases sexist attitudes uh, that have not uh, uh, welcomed uh, women in the field. Uh, so in a sense, women have felt less welcome. I know from colleagues that has been the case. And their research interests have not been welcome, especially if, re if related to gender and sexuality. Uh, and in general, they've not been respected, as respected, uh, and so they've re pursued other fields where they felt more welcome. And that is a shame, um, but uh, it is a fact. Um, there is a strong current of change, though, and women have to make themselves more visible uh, to some extent, uh, push the boundaries, push the envelope, throw wrenches in the picture, whatever. Uh, image works for you, uh, that's what I think we need to keep doing. Uh, no other issue uh, that is important, uh, one other issue that is important uh, is that chairholders are decided quite differently than they used to be. Uh, no longer can candidates be strong merely in Armenian studies, but have to contribute intellectually to other fields and to teach other fields. And I think that is a positive change and uh, opens up paths for women scholars. Uh, we need to speak to a larger audience and make interventions in other fields as well before or at the same time that we are recognized by our, uh, our own field uh, of Armenian studies. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Hore. Thank you. Great. So our next and final speaker is Christina Maranji. I know we are supposed to end at 3.30, but I, I know we I'll made a mistake. No, no, you don't have to be that quick, and we want at least 15 <laughs> minutes yeah, uh, of discussion. We will just either keep the break short, and we'll, we'll start a bit later in the next panel. Um, Krishna is the Arthur H. Dadian and Ara Östemel Chair of Armenian Art and Architectural History at Tufts University, and is also Chair of the Department. She is the author of three books and over 60 articles and essays on medieval Armenian art and architecture, including a survey of Armenian art forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Um, her most recently published monograph on the seventh, uh, seventh century architecture of Armenia won both the Sona Royan Prize for Best Armenian Studies monograph in 2017 and the Karen Wood Prize for Art History from the Medieval Academy of America in 2018. Marandi has engaged with the cultural heritage of Armenians for over a decade, working on historically Armenian churches and monasteries in what is now Eastern Turkey. Her campaign for Cathedral of Muren near Ani in present-day Eastern Turkey resulted in its inclusion on the World Monuments Watch List for 2015 to 2017. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Lerna, and thank you, Melissa, for this uh, organizing this event. It's so important. Can everyone hear me? And I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of it, and I'm learning so much. I wasn't able to be here this morning, but this, the panelists are, have been fabulous, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I have, two my list of questions, and um, I am going to answer them. And maybe just start as Barbara did a little bit with how I, how my own sort of, um, my childhood basically. I'll do this quickly. Um, but um, but I, uh, I I'm grew up in an Armenian household. I'm not Italian. I want to make that clear. I feel like I have to do that every time. 
I'm not, I'm not half Armenian either, which is often, I, I'm often asked. I don't know why, I just I think it's my affect or something. But I grew up in, in the States, in Connecticut, and when I was a girl, there were very few Armenian families in Westport, Connecticut. I was pretty much the only family, and so I was so embarrassed to be Armenian. Um, and when my parents would speak Armenian in the grocery store, I would tell them to stop, because nobody would know what it was, and it sounded weird, and I even told people, that I was Canadian, which when they asked me what I was, and I don't know why. I thought that was somehow safer. But um, so anyway, so that'll. Safe to be Canadian. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so that yeah, that that changed though. Um, that all changed by the time I, I got to college, um, and so yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about my intellectual trajectory. Um, I obviously I'm an art historian. And um, I always loved drawing and art as a kid. I would draw horses and, and I would pretend to be a horse and I did a lot of drawing. So that's sort of how it started. And then I really be began to love art history. I, I happened to take a course at UConn Stanford and um, there was an art appreciation course. And the professor said, none of you will ever major in art history, but this is, it's good that you're taking this course. Well. Look at me now. Um, I did, in fact, major in art history, and, and I went on with it. But I didn't immediately start with Armenian art. I was interested, first of all, in um, in Renaissance art, and then Western medieval. And um, but I found myself, and this was in the days of the professor Tom Matthews, who was a very important um, art historian at, in, at NYU back in the 90s. But he had a long career, and he was training. Uh, people like Helen Evans, for example, at the Met, the curator of, of medieval art at the Met, who's going to be holding a very big Armenian exhibit this year at the Met. Um, she was a student of his, and he had many other students as well, um, uh, women art historians who specialize in Armenian art, so they needed to be added to the mix. But I was, I was of a younger generation than that. But in any event, I went to speak to him um, at, you know, in my early 20s about Armenian art. It seemed to be, might be an interesting option. And he got very excited and told me about Nina Garsoyan. And, um, and Nina Garsoyan, I went to go see her and she was so generous with me. And this maybe gets me into my next question. But um, to start with, I have to say, it was, I started, even though I, I grew up Armenian, it, my interest in, in Armenian art came second to an interest generally in art and art, art history the very close study of images and monuments and objects, painstaking study of those things and their um, location in a historical context. That to me was really exciting and that's what drove me um, first and foremost. Um, and that actually answers my second question, so I'm being very efficient here. Um, and uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit now about Nina Garsoyan. So, I went to go talk to Tom Matthews, and he said, oh, you should go talk to Nina Garsoyan. So I went to the great Professor Garsoyan's offices in, in, at Columbia. So this is now in the 90s, like the early 90s. And she was just so nice to me. I mean, if you have met her or seen her, you know she is a formidable human being. And, um, you know, just a supreme authority in her field. Uh, so I was just sort of shattered upon meeting her. I mean, I knew she was something important, even though I didn't really know much about Armenian art yet. In any event, um, I, I, uh, she allowed me to audit a course with her on Armenian historical geography. It was a seminar. Uh, Robert Hewson, the famous uh, geographer of Armenia, was in that class too, and I was way over my head, but I just, you know, as you do when you're sort of a newbie, you just listen and you pick up words that repeat and you, you sort of, you know, you develop a kind of uh, uh, scaffolding for knowledge, and so that's what I did. And then um, she, I ended up going with her to uh, Kars and Ani, and um, into the north, into what we call Tyke, um, this very interesting Armenian Georgian marchland close to um, the G Republic of Georgia, but what was in what is now Eastern Turkey. And that was my first trip to outside of like going to England. Uh, I was terrified as an Armenian um, to go there. And, uh, but it, I will never forget it. And I'll never forget the time she took with me walking in Ani, walking the mountains um, of Tyke, 
Um, I, she was, she really sort of shaped my intellectual um, self, and I'm so grateful for her, uh, to her for that, although I never would imagine that I could ever amount to anything like what she has done. Um, I'd never met C.R.P. de Nersesian. Uh, she died while I was in college at Vassar, um, and I'm so sad about that. I have heard many stories about her. I actually, when I got a book, you know all the Armenian books at Harvard are in the depository, so I ordered one one day, and it came, and it had, the, it had napkins in it um, with writing in French and Armenian, and it was the, I knew it was her, I just knew it, so I haven't returned it yet, if you're looking, it's overdue, but I still have it, I don't know what to do with it, but, um, but that gave me a little bit of a sense of the realia of CRP. Um, she was, of course, a, the consummate um, scholar of Armenian manuscripts. And in a way, if you think about art history, uh, it's, it, it's one of those fields actually which has traditionally well represented um, women. So there, it's, it's uh, and in fact, my department right now, my department, it's um, about half and half, although I have to say, until I, be, until I was promoted, before I was promoted to full professor, it was just two full professors, both male. So hopefully that will change in the future. Um, but where was I? I was talking about um, CRP, yeah. So, um, so art history is predominantly, um, or, or is more balanced in terms of gender than a lot of disciplines. And there's a lot of support for women in the field, and that's traditional. So um, CRP was part of that, I think. And she is actually lauded among women art historians for being this, this important um, figure, as she is in the field of Armenian art. And she was amazing. So there's that, but she was focused on manuscripts, and I really started out always more interested in architecture, which is kind of more of a bro field, I guess. Um, you know, there's more, I mean, if you think about it, particularly with Armenian medieval monuments, there's more field work in the rough. We're not talking about, you know, urban spaces where you can, like, go to a cafe and then go to the cathedral next door. We're talking about hikes, we're talking about you know, uh, sheepdogs, we're talking about, um, you know, the, the military police, so it's a different kettle of fish. And um, so that's where I felt maybe more like I was striking out on my own. Having said that, the predecessor to me at Tufts, who founded the chair, and we cannot forget her, the founder of the chair of the, um, my chair at Tufts, is Lucy Dermanwellian. And Lucy was intrepid and went to Armenia during the Soviet period she has told stories which many of you may have heard about hiding film in her bosom to protect it from the police um, who were going to get it, and helicopter rides and everything. So she was an amazing, amazing woman, and I am forever grateful to her for, for founding the chair, which I now hold. Uh, there, so, um, okay, am I answering any of these questions? I hope so. Um, yeah, so, and, um, I do want to talk a little bit about the problems. In your career in Armenian studies, what kind of problems have you encountered? Okay, just quick, because Huri touched on a lot of, I think, problems with the chairs, so maybe I'll just cover some of the other kinds of problems that can happen. I'm not looking at you, Mark, for any particular reason, but, um, but there are, you know, as wonderful as it is to be, to, to, to be a part of the Armenian community and also be a scholar of Armenian art, Sometimes one feels hijacked, particularly in Q&A sessions, um, by people who, who I think mean well, but it's like, I, I have, I, let me give you one example quickly. They say that's a good idea on a panel to give a specific example. Um, I was giving a lecture on the Church of Zavart Notes. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And uh, the seventh century Church of Zavart Notes. I had read everything you could read on that church, okay? In, all the languages that are relevant. I'd read it all. I get up and I give the talk. And um, a man, probably in his 70s, uh, gets up afterwards and basically, he doesn't just get up and ask a question. I think it started that way. But then, then however I answered it, it was not sufficient. He got up, pushed me away from the podium, and actually took over and had me do the slides so he could explain everything the way I hadn't explained it apparently properly. 
And I, this was, if you can imagine, I have never, I mean, when I tell this story, people are like, okay, I've had some bad experiences, but that's the worst I've ever heard. And I would, if someone can top me, please. Um, but that really was, uh, that, that was a horrible experience. I, I will never forget it because it made me feel like a complete idiot. And I was so angry um, about it. And I know others were angry too. And that, sh I just, that should never happen. And I did feel afterwards, and I, stu I still do feel like, if I had been a man, if I had been, you know, like talking in a different register and, and maybe wearing a tweed jacket or something, maybe I w that wouldn't have happened. I felt so much like, you know, there is, that, there is this dimension, and I, I really don't like it. I still don't know quite what to do about it, but it makes me angry nonetheless. And that, I feel like, that's not helpful. It's not supportive. So. That's, um, but I think, you know, in terms of the chairs, I think Huri said what, what I would say too. And I would just say that I think really, bottom line is, you know, for me as chair is mentoring, mentoring, mentoring. I have a dozen students, all women, in, the, in different advising phases. Um, and I'm excited. And so there, good things are ahead. This is a part of the good things that are happening. Um, and obviously there's much more work to do. So I'm good with that if you Great. guys are. Yes, Thanks. thank you so much, Christina. Yeah. Okay, so we will have about 10 minutes for questions. Maybe we'll get the questions together. Oh, uh, I'm happy. I'm, I'm glad I and then, Yeah, I'll take three questions, <laughs> ideally quick questions, and I will turn to the panel. Uh, Susan, and then Mark, and then Tanya. Yes. Uh, just to be very quick, because Christina's very last um, story is something that I, I wanted to talk about, and then I didn't have time. What, what, what I noticed in all of this, and you see it elsewhere, not just from Sarmine, there, there are um, other incident, incidents or things that really shouldn't happen, people who shouldn't be where they are and so on. But then there are enablers around yes. them. Mm -hmm. Somebody should have gotten up and said, instead of you, said, that's it, thank you very much, get down. Actually, everybody should have stopped, yes. stood up and said that. You shouldn't be alone. But instead what happens, and there are women and men who do these, who are in these positions, who get up, and I think at least you mentioned somebody too, who get up and help the person, basically, or just be quiet because they don't want to hurt their feelings. Why is that person more important than you, for example? That's really, yeah, it's not mm -hmm. a question. No, 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 thank you. Yes, M Mark? It wasn't a nice <laughs> No, that's a no. It was an Irma, says Judy Saryan. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I'm pointing. Well, when was this? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh recently, very recent. Okay, yeah. Okay, Mark. Yeah, that's what feels right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, my God, so much to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say something earlier. Uh, about, um, I mean, if you go back to the early days of Armenian studies in, the, in this country, you had Nina Garsoyan, you had Sirapi Dernestesian, you had Luis Albania, you had uh, um, Mary Mat Kilborn Matosian, who's not Armenian, but was in the, working in the field. I mean, all these people were doing very important work by the 50s and, and early 60s. And what I was gonna ask earlier was, what happened? And then I heard Isabel's presentation, which I just floored, I, I, and I'm so glad you mm -hmm. said it. I mean, I'm so glad you talked about it because it. Ex I mean, it doesn't explain everything, obviously, but it explains a lot. So, mm -hmm. anyway, I'm sorry. There's no question here, but thank you. For <laughs> it, was it was a mystery. Okay, uh, Tanya. Yeah. I don't have a question either. Thank you very much. But I would like to add to Tanya's story the first comment about what happened to Christina that two more things Christina herself can say excuse me this is my pre presentation and just hold your ground and the second thing is that other than the community whoever was hosting that event should have also said something so there is a special burden on whoever the host was but thank you it's very inspiring thank you I actually have a question Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes I know that um, I don't know that much about Armenian studies, but I know the role of the donor has been very yes. important. So could people 
speak to the role of the donor um, money to fund the programs and how. So, sorry, sorry, Eileen. We didn't hear it. I think it's the role of the donor, yeah. right? The okay. Donor okay. The money that the donor contributes shapes the program, and if you have seen that, that has changed over the years. Oh, yes, Mayor Papazian, the president. Sign off on oh. like that. There will never be a, an agreement that interferes with the academic integrity of an institution. So I want to learn more about what happened there. That's outrageous. And uh, this is always a balancing act, money and values. But in any good institution and with any good leadership, you won't sign an agreement where that's the case. I, I just I think that's a huge problem. It happens right. sometimes, right. but it's about it's about you know having integrity and real academic values. So it's, it's absolutely a, right. But but it but sometimes <laughs> the, they hope it never shows up. Mm. Is what happens. Okay. Yeah. Question? Yes. Yes, I have a question for our art historian. Is the issue of what, the definition of what constitutes art worthy of study? Most of what we know about is always what men have done. Mm -hmm. Next year's a person who has introduced me to the topic, but the issue, some of the some of the types of art that we see yeah. involving things like weaving, yes. uh -huh. uh, and there's a whole yes. host of other things yes. that are anything by a woman. I understand is considered craft, and anything by a yeah. man is art. Yeah. <laughs> so it's right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sure. How yeah. this is changing or not changing in your field mm -hmm. with respect to Armenian art? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, yeah, so let me just back up a little bit before we talk about Arme Armenian women artists and talk and just mention in relation to the donors. I know that, that we were talking about modern programs, but it's very important to remember that, um, that women in the Middle Ages were major donors, and that has been very much overlooked historically. So we have all these beautiful 7th century churches, and a great number of them actually indicate that it, they, they indicate both the, the, um, a male and a female name attached to the, the building of the church, and, and this is very unusual in terms of across the Mediterranean. So why is this? And this has barely been studied in the literature. So I just wanted to say that in terms of donors, because there's a long history here of female donors, um, and of course in manuscripts as well. With regard to Armenian women artists, and this question of the definition of, the, of art. First of all, um, we have Armenian female painters um, going back to the Middle Ages. So we have, there are names and we even have images. Um, we have much more evidence for the weaving, for embroidering and for textiles. And But that starts already in the 15th century. We have objects, but we have textual sources discussing that from much earlier. These are, these are modern categories. This idea of art that we use now is a, is a 19th century idea of art, fine art being placed on the wall versus craft being you know, utilitarian to some extent. Those are modern, cat modern categories that may or may not apply to the pre-modern. So for example, a beautiful liturgical banner, 15th century, woven by women, and actually showing Herypsime, the, the female Armenian saint, um, very interesting to study that textile in terms of um, uh, gender studies. But in any event, that is from the 15th century. It was a liturgical banner. It was used in the church, just like um, metalwork was used in the church, just like manuscripts were used in the church, just like church had, it's had sculpture. And so what's art in there, what's not art? I don't know that that's something I think all of those elements are wholly sacred elements. They're part of the they're part of the the ritual. They're part of the fabric of the church. So I think, in a way, it's a it's a it's a category that may or probably does not, let's say, have necessarily have have resonance for the for the for the medieval women artists who are working. Great. Unless there is one last burning question. I declare that it's time for us to have coffee, cookies, cheese. It's outside, and we will be back at four. Four? Let's aim for 405. Okay? I know how to negotiate. Yes. Thank you.